it always excites me when failure happens because I think failure is a really good thing and people keep going. They take a few of the lessons learned and then they go invent something totally new, fail, and then somebody takes the torch and keeps carrying it on because that's how we you know, came from single cell organisms to what we are. And that's, I think, everything moves forward. I'm just excited about failure and innovation and constant running through brick walls. Hi, everyone. It's Jordan from the New Forum team. New Forum is a community podcast that invites purpose-driven visionaries, creators, and investors to spark accessible conversations on the topics of crypto, the metaverse, NFTs, and everything Web3. On today's episode, New Forum is honored to have Kyle Rojas, who oversees biz dev and partnerships at the Edge and Node, the core dev team working on the graph. So we are going to discuss the importance of understanding blockchain data and what the graph is working on. So Kyle, welcome to the episode. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you. Pleasure. Um, so Kyle, how did you get into Web3 and really what has kept you in the space up to this day? Oh, those are two different questions, right? I'd say I started out my professional life with uh, you know 12 years in the military. I was in the Air Force for a long time before choosing family over a, a pretty successful military career. After that, I got my MBA at Rice University here in Houston. And then I worked a little under seven years at Goldman Sachs. And while at Goldman, I'd been investing and participating in the crypto space since around late 2016. And then during that journey, probably a couple years in, I just became a big believer in the idea that not only is Web3 technology likely a big part of the future, it's also just most likely the best way to build for the world. So I finally worked up the guts to quit Wall Street and find some fulfillment in life. And I dove headfirst into my blockchain career. And now I'm a little less than a year and a half into my life at Edgenode, in Web3 specifically, and in my official title there, like you said, Global BDM Partnerships, though I also help oversee developer success, low-level tech support, I help with marketing and operations, just really anything I need to do to make the graph a success, and I'm, I'm having a ton of fun. Yeah, it's, it's really, really what a journey, like U.S. Air Force, the suit and tie to Web3, like uh, before we talk about the graph, like how was that journey from the Army, like do you see any differences really like brutal differences between your job at Wall Street and Web3 in general? Or do you think it's yeah. actually quite similar? Uh, I think they're very, at the same time, similar and dissimilar. And with the similarities, and I think one reason I'm glad I joined the military at a really young age was I learned a few key lessons I, I still see being able to work in any different industry. And it will give me you know, the the drive to succeed in anything I do, I think. And one of them is, I think I encapsulated as being able to run through brick walls, meaning if other people run into a brick wall, they give up and say, no one can do anything to get through it or over it. It's too high. And I just either run through it, dig under it, run around it, or find a way to jump over it. So you get really comfortable being able to deal with insurmountable odds. Uh, and you get really comfortable being uncomfortable, which is also another superpower. And then it's yeah, I'd say it's being able to push past your your breaking point of what you'd normally think and realizing you have another, you know, 50, 40, 50 percent in your tank and you can keep going. And I always find my red limit, feel that I've I, I can go a lot further and I keep going and I realize I just have more red lines or red limits uh, that I get to hit. And so that's it's been the same in, in Wall Street. That's what helped me succeed. It's been the same here. Um, but also, I'd say the reason I one reason I joined, or at least I was okay with joining different organizations, different industries, which is hard, starting completely over after 12 years and then seven years uh, in totally different spaces, is the idea of emotional anti-fragility, which means if I felt myself getting bored, I feel like I'd kind of conquered the biggest challenges. And once I got there, I realized I was going to start to atrophy mentally. Um, and with regards to my drive and so on, my goal setting. So I, I was okay of, of blowing up a really good life in two different instances and then uh, and then rebranding completely, which has been fun for me. It keeps me fresh, keeps me excited. And um, yeah, I hate being bored. Oh, so yeah, so after really running through a couple walls, your, your, your drive really brought you to the graph. Uh, when did you arrive at the graph and what led you to the graph? I've been investing and participating in the space for a long time. So when I was looking at opportunities, when I finally 
flipped the switch mentally and realized I didn't want to be the people above me. I didn't want to be the people around me um, that were, you know, slightly ahead of me. And I could see 20 years down the road and got really bored of, of knowing where I'd end up. I, I made the switch. I was like, All right, finally, I need to go get into this industry. And I looked around and I got actually got some really good offers at places like exchanges, I was talking to protocols. I got some even some exact level offers at organizations and um, both in the Web3 space and then out of the Web3 space uh, and CFO, COO level. But I chose to take a lot less and chose to take on a lot more responsibility in many cases to come work on this because I knew it was finally a time that I was able to work to learn, not work to earn. And I wanted to go to the place that was not only the most educational with regards to how much I'd be dealing with, the most challenging in general with regards to where they are on the zero to one scale, and also just taking on the biggest challenge in general. And that's why I chose the graph because to the first point, it's at the nexus of any project across right now, 39 chains. And I get to deal with every builder, every founder, every piece of technology, and actually help them succeed as a, an essential piece of infrastructure uh, providing, providing that service. So that's great because I get to learn almost every project on every chain that's integrated with the graph. And I'm speaking to many projects not using the graph and then many chains not using the graph. So I get to learn everything from the inside out, which is what I didn't have as an investor and participant because I was a heavy, still a heavy user of protocols in the space. And then uh, I'd say with regards to challenge, it's the graph is truly creating something that doesn't exist in the world. It's creating a decentralized indexing and query layer that no one's even trying to tackle because it's so difficult. People out there have said they're trying to tackle it in a decentralized way, but in the end, it's just easier to go and build something centralized and create another Web2 SaaS company. And the reason I joined this team, the third point is that I believe that this team was so values oriented. And that's why I was able to take less and take on responsibility simply because I wanted to be around people that were driven by such a strong North Star that I wanted to be around them. I wanted, you know, decentralization mentors. I wanted people that have really high standards without being selfish. And that's what I get on this team. And, and that's a really rare, fortunate, kind of pretty much lucky trait to uh, decision to have had. And, and it's, it's fulfilled every box that I wanted to check when I was getting out. So that's, that's why I chose the graph ecosystem aside from any others that I had some really good offers on and I'm having a hell of a time. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Uh, so how like specifically does the graph uh, work? Cause you obviously mentioned your, your drive brought you there uh, and you're mm -hmm. learning every day. There's so many like opportunities and protocols that you're working with. So sure. someone that would not know what the graph is, like, what is it? How does it work? And what are like the different components, the main components? I'll start with just high level. So the graph is decentralizing data indexing and query services for projects across the entire Web3 space. As I mentioned, currently integrated with 39 chains and networks and serving tens of thousands of users around the world daily. What's interesting is that Intel the graph no projects had really worked to solve the problem of reading data off of blockchains, let alone organizing it and making it useful in a scalable way. And if you think about the, the, Web3, the Web3 space in general, most things are about enabling peer-to-peer -peer transactions permissionlessly and then saving that information on a blockchain. But again, the graph works to organize and make that data usable. And because of that, again, until the graph, developers had to either manually sift through transactions, which is a bear if you've ever looked through Etherscan, or run their own servers, index the data themselves, and then build and maintain their own APIs, wasting scarce and always very expensive developer resources that should be spent on building and improving a project's core product and services. So the graph solves that problem. It enables developers to build open APIs called subgraphs that can support pretty much any data needed to populate a project's entire front end user interface. Uh, and with subgraphs, data is indexed, organized, and instantly available to populate into an application or website forever. I'd say without going into all the different um, parts of the, the network in general, I'd say subgraphs are essentially a blueprint with which indexers that organize and store the information and make it available. The subgraphs are the blueprint. Indexers use that blueprint to create the house with the on-chain data. 
And another way to look at that even simpler would be if you think of a giant Excel document, the subgraphs are the headings on the columns and rows telling exactly what they want every single block on any given blockchain. The indexers come in and fill every single cell in perpetuity and make that information available uh, forever. So that's that's how it works in simple terms, um, but happy to dive in if, if it's really necessary. But there's other stuff like indexers and there's a, something called curators. There are delegators, which increase the capacity of indexers by essentially staking or delegating their, their GRT. GRT is the work utility token within the ecosystem. And then the subgraph users pay for queries in GRT, the, the utility token. Yeah, you, you presented the different kinds of users. Um, I, I think we could take a step back and I would like to know, like for you, why blockchain data is so important to understand. You know, there's the quote that uh, knowledge is power. There's a lot of people that might not be aware of, you just explain what the graph does, but like, why is it so important to understand blockchain data and what can you do with it? Like you mentioned a couple of different kinds of users. I'm not saying this is a direct correlation, but if you look at web two, let's say you look at the biggest, most lucrative and most ubiquitous companies, they're data companies, right? All the web two companies now realize that data is more essential and valuable than their other business models. And then you look at the biggest companies in the world in there, um, besides Apple, you know, Google is a data company itself. Web two does it very sadly in a value extractive way, which is one reason I was easily able to unplug at the end from TradFi and Web2. But I think it just shows that data is essential for anything digitally. Anytime we're looking at a computer, anytime we're looking at anything on our phone, any website or application, anything that we go to is powered by data and a technology that is able to sift through, organize, and make that usable instantly in the most impactful and versatile way is going to likely be a very, very important part of any ecosystem. The graph is doing that for all public on-chain data, and it's by far the most, one of the most used protocols in the space because it's providing data um, in that way. Could you give like a brief description of what a subgraph is for the audience in case they, they don't know what it is? Uh, aside from what I just said, which is the blueprint to build the house yep. or the headings on the columns and rows, the subgraph is the open API that is a blueprint that indexers use to index, organize, and make usable all the information. So it's just a set of directions for indexers to populate, organize, and then make data usable. And, and you could just call it an open API in general. But the subgraphs, like I said, power majority of Web3 from the biggest DeFi AMMs and exchanges such as Uniswap, OneInch, uh, ShibaSwap, Trader Joe, PancakeSwap, SpookySwap, and more. So really the biggest AMMs and exchanges across the 39 chains that are integrated. The biggest NFT marketplaces like Sandbox, Foundation, Decentraland, and, and many more. The biggest data analytics platforms. So Masari, CoinGecko, Token Terminal, and much more. The biggest cross-chain dApps like Balancer, Sushi, Connect, Lido, Premia, and so on, and projects from most every other vertical in the space, such as bridges, wallets, identity, and so much more. The graph is, is queried well over a billion times per day by tens of thousands of users around the world. And the number of users is, is growing fast with usually, we see usually at least around 40 new users every day at the low end. Even in the bear market currently, you, you keep seeing that growth. Yeah, what's amazing is, let's say a little less than a year ago, we were excited, maybe more than you go. We were excited when there were a billion queries per month. That was an insane accomplishment. We're at a billion to almost 2 billion on some days every day in a bear market. Now in the bull market, it actually got up to 2 billion queries per day and then went back down. And now it's going back and forth from 1 to 2 billion. But even in the peak of the bull market, we still get there in the bear market. And it's consistently well above 1 billion, usually around 1.5 billion queries every single day. So it's powering most things across the Web3 space. And then when you think of where what other people are doing, uh, some people just do things and run their own indexing shops locally because they haven't used the graph yet, or they're using another technology that for some reason is has a, 
attracted them. But when folks use the graph, it's it's usually pretty sticky in the sense that it's probably the best solution out there right now by far. And that's because it's about half a decade ahead in R&D compared to the closest competitor, which is a lot fun, a lot of fun that we've been working on this for half a decade. Why, why do you, without naming any projects, but why do you think that you're like half a decade uh, ahead of, to your competitors or other projects that are working in this space? Well, not only because they were founded many years later, this was founded in 2017. So the graph ecosystem has been working on this problem a lot longer. And not only that, it's been battle tested a lot longer. So 2019, the hosted service launched, 2020, the decentralized network launched, and they've been working in prod at scale and large scale for many years. And other folks are, are just coming out with stuff and getting a lot of money. They're fundraising well, but they're just now starting to tackle data. And that pretty easily shows that the graph is half a decade ahead on and on R&D. And even if somebody forks the graph code because it's open source, the graph ecosystem has been working on upgrades for years. And like sub, you know, I'll talk about some of the upgrades that, that are coming up eventually, I'm sure. But it's going to take folks years to be able to use that stuff in prod that we've been demoing and testing for years on our end. So it's pretty fun to be in a, a technology that's so far ahead in R&D and doesn't get tired, doesn't get complacent um, in, with regards to advancing tech. And it's, it's just been so much fun working around some of the smartest people I've ever met and that just don't get tired and are always driving forward to make things better and more efficient for users and, and the world eventually. Yeah, you mentioned it like the graph has really become a reference uh, in the space. You know, you've built your ecosystem that keeps growing. So what does the roadmap look like for the graph? Because, you know, even hearing you and when you go on the website, it seems like you've accomplished so many different things. So how can you grow from here? Uh, is the goal to really focus on the Web3 space or is it also to kind of expand outside? Is it other chains? Like, what are you looking at in the future? Man, it's so cool that to realize from the inside out, it's still so early in the evolution of the graph. It's going to get so much better in the near term and then, of course, long term. But the graph ecosystem has has some really amazing stuff coming up, both, again, near term, 5 to 10 meter targets and the mid term, 50 to 100 meter targets for a military term. I'd say one of the most anticipated technologies, especially exciting to developers, is substreams, which moves from building APIs and assembly script to Rust, and that enables parallel processing of information, which is proven to increase indexing and syncing speeds up to 100x. In some cases, much more in some edge cases. What would be the an example of use cases? Like, Is it just in terms of speed or like, what are the future use cases that you see? Well, there are a couple things. One, indexing and syncing speed is still an issue, even though the graph is one of really the best technology out there, it's still an issue that people have problems with, and that can be a tough DX or developer experience. And substreams for the most data demanding subgraphs and projects out there will enable, again, up to 100x indexing and syncing speeds. And that's just one use case because another is cross-chain data composability to where people will be able to work together in a collaborative way more than they ever have right now, because right now folks can go clone a subgraph and then rebuild it. But then there's a lot of stuff they have to do. But when folks can work across chain, across tens of thousands of subgraphs at the same time in a collaborative way, that will increase innovation efficiency for subgraph developers and for the network in general. And that's what Substreams helps power, not just because of Rust, but because of the, the Firehose Primitive, which is a separate technology that upon which it's based and then the parallel processing of data based in the rest, rest language. So it's really cool that we don't even know, I mean, we can see it because we're testing it out and other folks are doing it in the demo phase and we know it can happen, but when we see it in the wild across tens of thousands of people, that's going to be really interesting. It'll open up some use cases that aren't even available on the graph right now. And we don't know what those will look like, but we're really excited about it. And a lot of developers are too. Yeah, of course. I mean, there, there's really a sense of accomplishment. Like, obviously, when we see your whole journey, you arrive and then you weren't sure where this was going. And now you arrive at, after the bull run, you see like the number of transactions. Um, I was wondering for, for a new user, Kyle, uh, that arrives, either a developer or someone that's completely new to crypto, 
what would be the best way to explore the graph, depending on if he's like a developer or uh, an indexer, a curator, like what would be the different steps that you would recommend? Would you mind if I finish the roadmap first? Because we have some other exciting stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, sure. So sorry about that. Because <laughs> we, I always love talking about it because there's so much fun. No, no, let's go back on the roadmap. You're, you're totally right. Yeah, no, substreams are fun. But also, the I think you mentioned that the decentralized network is going cross-chain. That is a huge milestone because Ethereum mainnet's been working in prod for a year and a half or so. Gnosis chain will be going to mainnet very soon. And then other chains will be announced in the very near future. And that just enables tens of thousands of people all across the 39 chains and unlocks decentralized indexing and querying, which is not possible for anyone right now on those chains. So that's really exciting for me to be able to bring the robustness, resiliency, uptime, and low latency of the network and, and everything else we're working on. Another exciting upgrade is the Arbitrum Layer 2 protocol integration, which will, that'll decrease the cost of interacting on the network from, to pennies, really from cents, uh, you know, cents on the current dollar, meaning it can take 40 or $50 to go through the whole process of deploying a subgraph. Right now, it may sometimes even more depending on what gas is doing it'll eventually cost cents or even around a dollar or two. So that's really, really important for users. And then we also have a fiat on-ramp integration coming up, which will decrease the number of steps uh, on the network for subgraph users, as well as help abstract much of the work token market volatility. So the, the GRT price volatility to decrease price swings and purchasing power for users. And that's something that's been you know, it came up recently from a lot of folks. They've been pushing for it. And we really hustled to make sure we get, get this across the line. Uh, and no timeline is specific on that, but it's, it's going to be in the near future. So that's exciting as well. So, so much coming up. Can't wait to talk about a lot more of it, but wanted to make sure I get all those across. With regards to the bull run last year, uh, mm -hmm. how that impacted uh, the graphs roadmap and even your personal view? Like, did you just... Obviously, NFTs and DeFi already existed, but we really saw the emergence of these trends, you know, DAOs, NFTs, et cetera. So how did that potentially impact the roadmap of the graph or even your personal views on blockchain data overall? I'll take those in two different ways. The first is what how it impacted the graph in general, the graph ecosystem rather, because the graph is just a protocol technology now. So on all the core devs working in the graph ecosystem, I love, love that in the bull market, at the peak of the bull market and now in probably the depths of the bear market, nothing has changed. Nothing with regards to straying focus from building out the most effective technology for decentralizing the index and query layer. Nothing's changed and nothing probably will change unless we need to adapt and take small course corrections or if something really big happens, we'd do a large course correction, but we have such a good roadmap right now. We have so many huge launches coming up. And we're working on things that will come out, you know, two, three, four, five years from now that are just so exciting and so important for the world. So I would say nothing's changed and I don't think anything will change. We have our North Star. We're going to make this happen. And it's going to be exciting for, for every participant within the ecosystem. And then with regards to me, again, I'm a heavy user across the space. So I love chasing things, testing things out, seeing if the technology works as opposed to just reading it and thinking it's cool. I've always loved that. And I love hopping from chain to chain. I do like NFTs in general, more just because I'm a nerd and I'll probably never sell mine. It's more just, be, I just it's fun for me. It stokes my dopamine receptors. But I've always been for sure the biggest DeFi nerd over above and beyond everything else. Um, and I think that's been the best product market fit in this space over the past few years, number of years, decade or more, I'd say. And, and we'll see what interesting use cases come up in the future. So on the graph ecosystem, we are full steam ahead. Bull or bear, it doesn't matter. We're still pushing to decentralize the world uh, on the infrastructure layer. And myself, you know, I could say what kind of things are exciting me and what I see going forward, but that's totally my personal opinion. Yeah, well, maybe we can briefly dive into your personal opinion before going back to the, to the graph. You mentioned like NFTs. Uh, what specifically are you interested in the NFTs? Is it like the utility when it comes to gaming, maybe loans, DeFi yield, subscription models? Like what excites you about NFTs? I'd say for NFTs is that the technological primitive of NFT technology is so versatile 
that it's not only cartoon pictures of apes that sell for a lot of money. It's, and I love gaming. I was always kind of a gamer, a closet gamer, and I'm still like a nerd gamer when I, when I can find the time, even though I rarely do. But to think that NFT technology can be utilized in one game, let alone cross game across, you know, multiple ecosystems of games is really exciting to me. And that's just the digital ecosystem and world. I'm also excited, very excited about what NFT technologies are going to do for the real world, how it could simplify real estate transactions and make intermediaries unnecessary from, let's say, every part of intermediaries from finance to real estate to legal. A lot of that stuff, the due diligence can be verified on chain if that information is sitting in a, again, unchangeable NF NFT that I don't know how it'll look. And a lot of people are trying it, some dead bodies along the road, but it always excites me when failure happens because I think failure is a really good thing and people keep going. They take a few of the lessons learned and then they go invent something totally new, fail, and then somebody takes the torch and keeps carrying it on because that's how we you know, came from single cell organisms to what we are. And that's, I think everything moves forward. I'm just excited about failure and innovation and constant running through brick walls. So that's... Uh, yeah, I'm really excited about what FT technology will do for the world in the next five to 10 years, well beyond just art and well beyond gaming, but I'm really excited for the gaming aspect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same. Going back to the graph, but tying it to what you just said, um, and obviously this is speculative, so so it's not something that for okay. sure. No, no, I'm saying this in the sense that like uh, it's not because you say this that the graph will necessarily do it. But when mm -hmm. you look at things like augmented reality, virtual reality, the experimental stage of the metaverse, how do you envision the graph interacting with these different things? Obviously, we're not sure where this will go, but is there something that you've thought about on the personal level and you're like, maybe this could work with the graph, you know, the metaverse, maybe virtual reality could be, we could apply blockchain data and do something. Have you thought about it or it's too, it's too soon? I've definitely thought about it. My mind doesn't really stop going through simulations. It's just my overactive nature, but I extrapolate from there or expand and think of the total addressable market meaning virtual reality and augmented reality games and everything else, if they have any information on the blockchain, they will need to find a data technology to index and use it. Full stop, you have to. And that's just one use case. What about when the world's supply chain data goes on chain? People are tracking hydrocarbons from oil and gas on chain. What about when ev most, I wouldn't say every, but most financial tractions, uh, transactions are on chain? What about when they track personal identifiable information? Driver's licenses are on chain as NFTs, let's say soul bound tokens of some sort. Uh, what if any information that could be on chain is potentially a source of um, volume for the graph? If, and I hope, and I'd say when the graph maintains its most uh, powerful and prominent space in the, in, this, in the ecosystem. So as Web3 eats the world's data and transactions and history in general, the graph will be there as the best solution to index, organize, and make that data usable. And then if you think what really excites me about data is that you think one transaction, one transaction on a blockchain happens once, but that one transaction can be read an infinite amount of times. And so when you compound that, all the amount of information that's sitting on these blockchains just within the Web3 space, and then gaming, and then art, and then supply chain, and oil and gas, and um, personal information, every single point of data can be read an infinite amount of times. And each of those equates to a query that if, if it's all used within the graph, then that increases the utility of the ecosystem. Um, so that's just exciting for me because the, the possibilities are, are really infinite if you think of it that way. Yeah, definitely endless. Are there any hurdles or like obstacles that the graph has faced or is going to face? Because there's the question of what will happen if there's mass adoption in terms of data processing? Like, what are there any hurdles basically for the graph? I think there's always hurdles in something nascent that's not decades old because it's still a, an early technology that is only decentralized on Ethereum. We still need to get 39 chains integrated with the decentralized network. And then there's over 50, almost 60 chains 
waiting to be integrated with the graph. So we need to integrate them. So we need to make sure the decentralized network works as well as it does right now at scale and continue to make it better. The UX, the billing process, the DX, all can be made better. It's good, but it needs it will always need to be better. And that's why it will be a never-ending goal, which is, is worthwhile for a life's mission in general. So that's one hurdle is that it's still going zero to one across all chains. Uh, and then the founding team behind the graph and then all the core devs working on the graph, let's say the point of a decentralized network is to be autonomous as opposed to needing a certain number of teams in their interaction. And so that is work that needs to be done eventually to truly abstract or subtract the teams that are building it right now and make it an autonomous organization in the world that can thrive and grow going forward with mathematical parameters that enable it to um, to grow healthily and not, I'd say, be sabotaged by anyone. It's unsabotageable. So that's exciting. And that's never really happened in the world. And to be able to try to build something that's never been built is something that I've never experienced in my life. And it's so, it's so damn exciting, to be honest. And it just pumps me up. I'm jazzed all the time about it. No, for sure. I mean, and, and going back to also your, your I would call them the, your guilty pleasures, DeFi or NFTs. Um, what's your favorite game, game? Is it a Web 2 game or is it a Web 3 game? Definitely not a Web 3 game. I think... Uh, uh, I would have been surprised if you told me a Web 3 game, but... I think Web 3 games are in the era that of DeFi when it was 2017. So a bunch of white papers, a bunch of ideas, and maybe some cool think, shiny objects come out. And they get a ton of funding, which gaming pr protocols and projects are right now. And then they still had three or four years to, that they had to build to come out with something with true product market fit before it set off the bull market. So that's where I think games are. Maybe one or two years, because I know some projects that are working very fast and they're going to come out with stuff in a year or two that are very cool. But I think it's still you know years away from getting to the 2020 to 2021 era of DeFi. And that's okay. Um, but to answer your question, I like open world games because I'm spacey and I just need things to, I need to explore things. I need to create things. I need to do puzzles. So Breath of the Wild is probably one of my favorite games. Um, have you, and uh, and I'll, I'll tie this to the to blockchain, have you tried the Elden Ring, the game? I have, I have. So, and it's so extremely hard, but it wasn't my console. So I, I couldn't get used to it. And so I just need to, I need to try it on my own and get past the learning curve because I heard it is such an amazing game, but I just didn't, I really don't have the time anymore, but I can't wait until I have the time to just, I'm, I'm a binge guy. So I just like batch and I do nothing but it. So I can't wait to just own that game one day. Um, and I'll get there. Could we imagine a use case, uh, very abstract. So let's imagine that Elden Ring, uh, which is an open world game where you can like get items when the boss dies. Uh, yep. It was a web three game. Uh, how could the graph interact with this game? Like what would be the data? Would it be the objects? Would it be the character identity? Uh, obviously, this is a very imaginary discussion, but let's yeah. imagine that this Web3 Elden Ring is the best game out there uh, and it's a Web3 game. How could it interact with the graph? So if you, if you think of the builders of the game, let's say it's based on smart contracts and those smart contracts uh, have base data that's on the blockchain to be able to populate with items scattered throughout. When you're walking throughout, you come across something and you pick it up or let's say something needs to be under a rock, you pick up the rock and there's this thing without the graph there to enable them to go pull the information and populate, you wouldn't know it's a, a red gem. You, it would just be blank. So that is base protocol across the entire video game. And then you think of every user that comes in, they create their username, they create their costume, they create their, you know, their class and everything else. Every time someone looks at that, or every time it pops up on the, the user interface, so the, the screen, every one of those is a poll to the graph, every single one. Every single time you look across the entire landscape, each one of those data points, a mountain, whatever it is, unless it's an engine that doesn't need to query something, which they could probably cache a lot of that stuff, but all those things that are populating new things into the game, all pull from the data set, especially if it's stuff that's recorded on a blockchain. Again, the graph is only doing public on-chain data. And that means that there are a few things that would happen inside of a game like this 
that wouldn't be pulling from the graph. There'd be some use cases if they want to store some stuff on Arweave, you know, that pay once store forever or Filecoin in real time and just pin it. There's some other stuff like let's say oracles come in and they take off-chain data, which the graph doesn't deal with, and they verify that information on-chain because you want to see what happened in the real world and factor it into a game, which would be super cool because if you had an engine, an AI engine, you know, machine learning in general, that would allow the game to adapt based on outside information in the world. That would be very cool, but the graph wouldn't deal with that until the Oracle put that information into the engine, which put the information on chain, and then the graph would be used to index and query all that information. So I would say, just like the, the Web3 space, it'd be almost every part of the game that wasn't static, uh, but even stuff that's static and historical information, all that would be indexed and queried through the graph. Has there been uh, also conversations within the graph team about kind of digital identity, verifiable credentials? Because that's also a huge topic that is starting to be tackled. How do you see the future of verifiable credentials and how it ties into the graph? Like, would it be like one data entry point? Like, would the, your digital identity be multiple information points? That's tough to answer because we don't know what that's going to look like. Is it going to look like Web2 credit systems? In my opinion, that needs a lot of work because that's not totally transparent. Is it going to be based on wallet or based on soulbound tokens or or something else? And I think of it as reputation, which you can say is credentialization, credit score in general, um, but those can be based in one wallet as opposed to what if I have a ton of wallets right, all over and across different chains. So how do you connect that? So I'd say we still don't know how it's going to look, if it's going to work, but a lot of very smart people, maybe not a lot, a handful of very smart people are working on this stuff. And I know some of them and their very values aligned. They want to figure this stuff out. They want to make the web two traditional finance world better. And so when smarter people are working and a lot of smart people are working on something, I think it'll get figured out eventually. But with that, my answer will always be if anything's kept on chain because there's wallet information that's kept on chain. When that stuff is queried, the graph will will be used to query it. When you have to ping across multiple blockchains, this is one thing that the graph, I think, will do very well eventually. When you have cross-chain composability and you need to aggregate information from one person across many wallets, across many chains, there's no way to do that right now. And the graph could eventually be used to do that in an instant because it'll be instantly queryable and indexed though I'm, I'm not sure exactly how that will look, but I could see that happening. And then you think of every other data point on any other blockchain that's integrated with the graph that would need to be pulled in for reputation. It's not verifiable if it's not on chain, but if it's not indexed and not usable, it doesn't matter and it won't aggregate into a credit score regardless. So if you don't have access to the data, you don't have an output. And so the, the graph enables that use case. It really enables... I'd say the graph enables any use case in the Web3 ecosystem, no matter what, because data is essential for anything. And and that's that's pretty crazy to be working on something like this. Um, as we approach the end of this episode, Nikala, is there any uh, final thoughts or anything that has inspired you uh, recently? It could be an article, a person, a project uh, that you would like to highlight. I'm lucky that I'm on, I'm on a team that constantly inspires me and drives me forward. Um, not only from the founders, but the people I work with and the values orientation, I feel very lucky to be able to say that and have like a, a really important mission that makes me happy at night. Naturally, folks like Vitalik, who can avoid tribalism, that can have remain pragmatic with an open mind and yet still avoid tribalism is incredibly impressive to me. There's many of those throughout the the ecosystem, but in bear markets, you see a lot of, and in, in bull markets too, you just see a lot of tribalism. And I'm more about the open-minded social ability of this space, as opposed to the um, closed-minded, I have the solution, this, this can never get better uh, mentality. So I think anyone with that mindset, really kind of the childlike mind of just uh, being able to, wanting to learn every single day, as opposed to saying, the the solution is has been created. I have it, and anyone else that does anything is is wrong and wasting time and a and a phony fraud 
and so on. But that's me because I enjoy trying to learn stuff every day and, and I get bored if if the solution's already there and, and then I need to sail off and do something else. Uh, l- luckily for us, so uh, Web3 is not a boring <laughs> place. So Not boring at all. Really? I don't think it'll boring, be boring in my lifetime or at least my professional lifetime. But I would say anyone that's listening to this, try to get involved as much as you can. Hop into Discords, hop into Telegrams, hop into the graph ecosystem and see why it's one of the most exciting ecosystems to be part of today. And apply for a job. We're hiring for multiple roles across the ecosystem, right? The core dev teams are hiring for a ton of roles. Become a graph advocate. Uh, and then just hit me up if you ever need anything regarding the graph, whether it's using the host service, the decentralized network, migrating to the network. Uh, my my na- username is or handle is Kyle A. Rojas on everything from Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Telegram, and so on. So people can find me pretty easily and, and usually able to set some time apart to answer. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Cal, for being part of today's episode. And as you mentioned, uh, the links for the graph and Cal will be in the description. Uh, cool. As for us, uh, if you want to get more involved in the community, make sure to follow us on our social platforms. So Twitter is newform underscore NCO. Uh, and as Cal mentioned, yeah, don't forget to like explore, try things out um, and like and subscribe to the channel. And really your support is appreciated and then have a great day. Bye.